welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and I'll be your host. May has arrived, and while April has been dominated by coronavirus, the work to end aging continues with a renewed sense of urgency. Let's take a look back at the recent developments. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, our Ending Age-Related Diseases Conference is going online in 2020. We will host our conference on August 20th and 21st as planned, and our main event will feature more than 16 hours of discussion panels and presentations. We'll also have interviews, online poster sessions, and networking opportunities. Tickets will be $500 for a deluxe option that features a premium networking program and $300 for a regular ticket and we will offer early bird discounts of 10% before May 21st. Further discounts will be available for our Lifespan heroes. On the subject of COVID-19, we've released a lot of great content related to the pandemic, including the COVID-19 Therapeutics Roadmap, a crowdsourced curated database that follows the progress of candidate therapies through clinical trials. Find out more on our website. There are many lessons to be learned from the current COVID-19 pandemic. One important takeaway, however, is already self-evident. Age is one of the most significant risk factors for COVID-19. According to the CDC, the risk of death from the disease starts rising sharply after age 40, rising dramatically with every additional decade of life. This highlights the importance of aging research. We also have posted two video interviews which were conducted by Brent Nally, and which touch upon the current state of aging research in the age of COVID-19. One is with Dr. Alex Zavarankov of Insilico Medicine, and one is with Dr. Aubrey de Grey of the SENS Research Foundation. Here's a clip from the interview with Aubrey, in which he discusses the impact of the pandemic on his work and his thoughts on the near-term future. I'm extremely lucky. I have a beautiful house in the mountains about um, half an hour south of the SENS Foundation headquarters in Mountain View. And, you know, I'm holed up there with my fiance. And, you know, we have enough food, we have enough sunlight, you know, really, you know, I am not suffering at all. Uh, But of course, the foundation is suffering in the sense that there's only a couple of people in the lab at any one moment, and therefore work is going much more slowly than it otherwise would. And that's certainly a a great shame. The uh, foundation is still ticking over. People are going in and getting work done, but only at a level maybe one third of normal. But it's, it's definitely quite frustrating. Of course, we will, you know, ramp up as fast as we can when, we, when we're allowed to, which may not be too long now. Uh, and we are certainly doing everything we can, working from home uh, to do stuff that was otherwise, um, you know, too far down our list of priorities. So things could be worse. Yeah, I mean, of course, things that happen, um, you know, at random random times, but happen with a, you know, reasonably constant frequency over time, they do have that character of being surprising when they happen, but not being surprising in another way. So, you know, earthquakes, um, perfectly good example, right? Um, So, uh, yeah, I mean, in that, that sense, it's true. But what it's done, of course, is it has enormously highlighted how poorly societies around the world have implemented preparedness strategies for all of this. You know, if you, I mean, the comparison with earthquakes is quite, probably quite a good one because in uh, parts of the world which have a respectable frequency of earthquakes, even if serious ones only happen maybe once every few decades, that's often that um, building regulations are, you know, uh, designed with earthquakes in mind. So that buildings will have, and you know, not just buildings, but other things like bridges and so on, will uh, be, be as, as as tolerant of such things as they can be. And it's obviously very clear right now that uh, society has completely failed to adopt that kind of principle when it comes to pandemics. Perhaps the reason it, that's been the case is simply because this is the first example of a pandemic that not only has high infectivity, but also has this additional issue of 
a rather long latency period um, uh, between becoming infected and being, being infectious until one actually gets symptoms. Of course, we have infections like HIV that have that characteristic, but uh, HIV is not highly infectious. You actually have to have sex with someone or have you know, blood from someone infected or something like that. Whereas this is an infection that is just as infectious as um, you know, any regular um, common cold or flu. So I guess the fact that we've had these things combined in the same virus is a one-off. But again, it would be crazy to suggest that that was ever, never going to happen. Um, and of course, in, in another big sense, we've been extremely lucky that, first of all, the latency period is only a few days rather than like, you know, the, the time frame of HIV, for example. And secondly, the actual severity of the virus is only slightly worse than your average flu. I mean, a few times worse, but not nearly so bad as, for example, SARS or, or MERS. So in a, in a sense, we've dodged a bullet that doesn't, seem, doesn't really feel like that right now. I think realistically, we have to, it went looking forward, we have to acknowledge that the general public is probably going to revert as much as it is allowed to, to business as usual, and you know, not have COVID on its mind all the time. If we look at, for example, what happened after 9-11, um, you know, people have just tried to um, carry on as normal, even though there is this knowledge at the back of everybody's mind that the terrorist threat is much greater than, you know, people believed it to be but more than, uh, prior to 20 years ago. One exception may be the way that the elderly and indeed other high-risk groups, those with pre-existing conditions and immune suppression and so on, um, are treated because such people are going to have to be maintained in a much more elevated degree of social distancing than the rest of the population for a long time while there remains a virus out there. And this is true not only because those people are much, have a much higher risk of severe illness and death once they get the infection, uh, but also because even when we get a vaccine, you know, vaccines just don't work so well on, in the elderly. So, so, so you know, it's, it's, it's a scary thing, that. And it will continue to be at the front of people's minds, I think, for a while, which could be useful because it will mean that there is greater public support for measures that are taken not by the man in the street, but by governments and other decision makers and opinion formers and so on. Um, so there I'm thinking in terms of the application of much of greatly elevated um, amounts of tax dollars to things like research into vaccine development, you know, um, training of medical personnel, uh, construction of infrastructure, all of the things that would put us in a position of much greater preparedness to, um, to nip the next pandemic in the bud well before it even becomes a pandemic. I mean, basically what's going to happen, I think, is that as the, as the demographics changes in terms of the virus, in other words, as we have a gradually increasing number of people who have had the virus and recovered and can be shown to have a nice high titer of antibodies so that they are not likely to be infected again and they can't pass it on again, those people will, of course, be able to return to relatively normal life. Um, but everybody who has not had the virus and therefore is still at risk is going to have to live differently. And in particular, those people who A, have not had the virus and B, are in a high risk group will have to continue to live very differently for quite a long time to come. We do have this situation right now where the elderly are very much more affected. It may be true that the biological age of the lung is what matters the most, but let's not get too into the weeds quite now. Let's just <laughs> stick to biological age in general. Um, we do know, I mentioned already, that vaccines don't work so well in the elderly, but of course the entire immune system doesn't work so well. Um, so it's no surprise that infections in general affect the elderly more than they affect young adults. Um, but the gradient of that curve, the fold difference, the, the, the multiplier by which the elderly are more vulnerable in this particular virus is much higher than average. And so that, I guess, may concentrate minds a bit more. You know, if, an, if the death rate of people over 80 
is much higher, let's say two or three times higher during the year 2020 than it was during the year 2019, which I think is quite possible um, globally, then, you know, that's a big wake-up call. And it, it, it's a question that I think advocates in this area, not just scientists, ought to be focusing on so as to concentrate the minds of decision makers and policy makers on the human right that exists to have as, as good health you can, irrespective of how long ago you were born. So that means that translates, of course, into elevated funding for all of the biomedical gerontology research that organizations around the world, including, of course, Sense Research Foundation, are uh, undertaking so as to try to um, keep people youthful or indeed to genuinely rejuvenate people, restore them to good health, um, even though they are chronologically old. You can find the full interview on our website and YouTube channel, alongside new episodes of the Life Extend show. And now for our research roundup. In recently published work, a group of researchers has demonstrated that treatment with NMN, a precursor of NAD, restores neurovascular coupling in aged mice. Since neurovascular coupling deficiency seems to be a major factor in the age-related decline of cognitive and motor functions, this discovery presents exciting new possibilities for longevity research, including in the fight against Alzheimer's. Nevidoclax is a cancer drug with strong senolytic effects, but it has the serious side effect of disrupting blood platelets. But a new mouse study published in Nature Communications indicates that researchers have developed a way to modify it to be less toxic to blood platelets and more effective at removing harmful and inflammatory senescent cells. The refinement of existing senolytic drugs to be more selective and have fewer off-target effects is a solid step forward in preparing these drugs for eventual wide human use. A group of researchers has succeeded in directly reprogramming fibroblast cells into photoreceptors and transplanting them into mice, which resulted in partial restoration of vision. This achievement can potentially lead to the development of cheap and effective treatments for conditions such as age-related macular degeneration, the leading cause of vision loss in older people. According to the results of a study recently published in the journal Aging, metformin restores mitochondrial function and repairs metabolic defects in cells from people with myotonic dystrophy, a condition that shares many of the same characteristics as aging. A new study published in the Journal of Proteomics builds on previous studies and suggests that intermittent fasting has a host of benefits in humans, not just mice. During the study, the participants ate a pre-dawn breakfast, fasted throughout the day, and had dinner at sunset for a period of 30 consecutive days. The fasting regimen was conducted without eating or drinking between these two meals, so no snacks or drinks were allowed. Participants were allowed to follow their usual diet during non-fasting hours. The study showed improvements in multiple critical health biomarkers, including circadian clock rhythm and cognition. The blood biomarker data also suggests that fasting in this way may be protective against many well-known age-related conditions, such as cancer and obesity, along with Alzheimer's disease. New research shows that resveratrol, a chemical found in red wine, contributes to genomic stability by reducing the occurrence of DNA double strand breaks and prolongs lifespan in genetically modified mice that are prone to carcinogenic mutation. The authors suggest that maintaining genomic stability would likely prevent the formation of mutations and suppress cancer development. Resveratrol and other similar compounds have long been known for their cancer-mitigating and life-prolonging qualities. The current research provides an intriguing possible explanation for this that can be relevant for future cancer and longevity research. A group of researchers has succeeded in engineering a new kind of microscopic bio-object that may one day be used for personalized diagnostics and targeted delivery of drugs. The object features a genetically modified E. coli bacterium and demonstrates a substantial improvement in motility over previous designs. Nanocarriers of different kinds can potentially revolutionize longevity therapies by performing early diagnostics, continuous monitoring, and targeted treatment of age-related diseases, but continued work must be done from the standpoint of survivability, biotoxicity, and more. It has been quite a while since the community had fundraised for the major mouse testing program. Unfortunately, the start of the experiment was delayed due to a number of issues encountered along the way. However, we are delighted to announce that the experiment has been approved and has finally launched. In the study, 40 mice will be treated with a combination of senolytics and compared to 40 control mice. Blood samples were taken before the start of the senolytic treatment 
in subsequent blood draws will happen during the study to track changes and determine the health of the animals. We'll be sure to pass along additional news as the study progresses. That's it for our research roundup. For more information on any of these topics, visit lifespan.io forward slash roundup. On Saturday, May 2nd at noon Eastern Time, Journal Club will return with Dr. Michael Lusgarten to discuss biomarkers of aging and how to best improve them. If you want to participate, become a Lifespan Hero today. Our Lifespan Heroes will also get access to a conversation on COVID-19, aging, and the future of healthcare, which will take place on Thursday, May 7th, and feature experts including Dr. David Sinclair, Dr. Aubrey de Grey, and our very own Keith Comito. Just like our Ending Age-Related Diseases Conference, the Longevity Leaders Congress is going virtual this year. Taking place from May 19th to May 22nd, this four-day event will feature both live and on-demand content, along with tremendous networking opportunities among leaders in the longevity industry. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Once again, I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and on behalf of the team at LEAF, we wanted to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Music